Our next question comes from Crowy with four exclamation marks. So I guess I should shout that Crowy from Australia. He says, hey, mate, new subscriber from Australia here. Awesome. Thank you for subscribing. Enjoying your videos, especially the women's self-defense ones. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, those are fun to make. Greatly appreciated. Do you have one on what a boxer is looking at when they spar or fight? Is it a general overview or specific areas such as what they want to hit? Or are they watching the other's gloves? Not after a handout, just, uh, just a hand up. Cheers, man. All right, Crowy. Crowy, my friend. Um, as a general rule, what to watch in a fight? Watch the torso. Watch the area between the shoulders and the hips. And here's why. Because you're going to see that move long before the hands get to you. You'll see this move before the feet, the legs, the arms, anything else moves. If you're watching the hands, they get you. If you're looking at the target you want to hit, your opponent sees your intention. That's why in kickboxing, one of the dumbest and still most highly effective techniques to land a head kick is to look at the guy's leg. After you've kicked him in the leg once or twice, look at his leg and then kick him in the head. Because he's expecting a leg kick. Oh, he's looking at my leg. Boom. Kick up high. And you can do the opposite. Look at the eyes. Look at the eyes. Boom. Kick the leg. Didn't see that coming. Why? Because people have this weird tendency to watch the eyes. But yeah, as far as boxing, watch the torso, right? This box between the shoulders and the hips, and you'll see most of the movement before it happens. You'll fall prey much less often to fakes and feints. If you're watching the hands, I might do something goofy like just raise my hand to fake a jab, because for some reason just raising my hand up translates in our minds as, oh, that's a jab. And we tend to react to this the same way we would to that. I don't know why, but we do. But if we watch the torso, suddenly this doesn't have the same effect. Weird, right? So yeah, watch the body the, between the hips and the shoulders. Can't stress that enough. As opposed to what Mr. Miyagi said in The Karate Kid. Look eye. Always look eye. No, 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 no. no. There's a time and a place to look at the eye, and it's not always. It's the exception, not the norm. Sorry, Mr. Miyagi. You had some great life advice, but some terrible fighting advice. Next question. Our next question comes from our friend Raimundo Gutierrez, who says, Maybe you want to answer this in Q&A with the coach. Yes, I do, Raimundo. Absolutely. He says, Can you be a good fighter even if you don't train boxing, kickboxing, or similar sports? Imagine that you don't like striking sports, but you train judo, BJJ, grappling, etc. Okay. Well, in that case, you'll be a one-dimensional fighter. In modern mixed martial arts, you need to be well-rounded. You need to be a good striker, and you need to be a good grappler, and you need to be good at bridging the gap between striking and grappling. You need all those skill sets to be competitive in professional and even amateur MMA. Now, compared to the average person, if you're a phenomenal grappler and you don't know anything about striking... Yeah, absolutely. You can, you can kick the average person's butt. You're going to seem like a Jedi compared to the average person in a lot of fights. But if you want to be a competitive fighter, a mixed martial artist, you have to know how to strike and you have to know how to grapple. So, grappling is awesome. If you hate striking, you don't have to do it. One of my favorite athletes, combat sports athletes of all time, Marcelo Garcia. Love Marcelo to death. I love... His work, I love his attitude, I love his personality, I love his technique. He's an awesome guy to watch and to learn from. And Marcelo, man, one of the most decorated grapplers ever. He has won, he's become the champion of, of almost every major jiu-jitsu and grappling competition on planet Earth. And he's beaten this who's who list of, of everybody relevant in the sport of of grappling from his generation 
And Marcelo Garcia, he decided uh, he wanted to do mixed martial arts for a while. He got talked into competing in MMA because people thought, okay, we'll take one of the best grapplers, we'll put him in MMA, it's going to be awesome. Seems like a no-brainer, right? And Marcelo, he had an MMA fight and it didn't work out. He didn't like the experience. He wrote about it and said, I, I kind of hated it. It wasn't what I loved. Like, I love jujitsu. When I do jujitsu, I'm happy. But, you know, with all the striking and the, the, uh, the mindset and everything else that goes into MMA training and MMA competition, it made me unhappy. And I didn't like how I felt when I was doing that. And so, you know, he quit MMA and went back to the thing that he loved, jujitsu. So if you love grappling, cool, grapple. Everybody should train, but not everybody needs to fight. Fight training, cool. Actual fighting, it's not for everybody. It's really not. Take it from me, it's really not for everybody. But yeah, if you want to be a complete, well-rounded fighter, train in everything. Next. Our next question comes from our friend Logan, who says, What level is amateur MMA? What would one expect? There are a lot of variables in that question. There is amateur MMA with guys who, you know, literally just got up off the couch and thought it would be a neat idea to fight and don't know what the heck they're doing. And there's amateur MMA where these guys are ready to go pro and succeed. So usually, if you've got good matchmakers, they'll pit people with similar experience against each other, but not always. So if you're planning on fighting amateur Scout out that show that you are thinking about fighting in. Watch it. See how the matchups are. And gauge the level of competition. Do these guys look like they're almost entry-level professionals? Or actual professionals? Or do they look like, you know, guys who've been training for a little bit and they're still figuring stuff out? Because amateur MMA, just like professional MMA, there's a pretty steep degree in levels. You know, a lot of times you say pro MMA fighter and we think like, oh, UFC, top contender, champion of the world. And that's, that's not the case either. There are levels to the levels to the levels, man. In professional MMA, there are entry level fighters who, you know, may still be close to that amateur level. There are journeyman fighters who you know, they, they got some skills, but they're, they're still trying to figure it out. They're ham and eggers, man. Guys who just go out there and they fight for a little bit of money to keep themselves going. Whatever they can get. The term ham and egger, it's an old boxing term for people who would box to get just enough money to buy a plate of ham and eggs. Because that's all they cared about was that paycheck. And, you know, you got contenders. The guys who are actually fighting for the titles in the big shows. So, yeah, both amateur and professional, pretty big, steep changes in degrees. So, like I said, scout out the show you want to fight for. And you'll see pretty quick what to expect. What level are these guys... Will they match you up evenly or not? Good luck to you. Next question. Our next question comes from our friend BRCB, who says, I have one question, if I may, you may. I have tennis elbow in both arms since last year, and it doesn't heal. I've seen a lot of doctors. I did a lot of healing treatments, lasers, etc., but nothing worked. I'm practicing karate, so I don't use my grip, but I would like to continue grappling a little. Do you have some advice about how to deal with tendonitis? Okay. So tennis elbow is a condition you get in the elbow. It's called that because a lot of tennis players get it because of the repeated stress of swinging that racket in a certain way that puts all that stress on the elbow, causes inflammation, tendonitis. Okay. But tennis isn't the only sport where this can occur. If you have read Jack Dempsey's book, championship fighting, you may recall he uses the term pure punching and impure punching. 
And this book, this chapter, and this understanding of what a pure punch versus an impure punch saved me from the same thing that's, that's happening to you. It got so bad. I got so much inflammation over the years of so much punching. So much wear and tear on my elbows. The one day I was grappling and I just got poked in the elbow. Not the funny bone, just poked in the elbow in a spot that shouldn't have been sensitive. And it flared up like fire burning in my arms. And I felt like I was dying. I felt like, oh no, they're going to have to amputate this thing. I'm never going to be able to train again. That's how it felt. It was horrible. But I persisted and it happened a few times. Man, it was worse than getting kicked in the liver, worse than getting kicked in the groin, worse than any of that stuff. It was horrible. It was crippling, debilitating. And this went on for some time. But I read that book. And then I remember talking to a friend of mine online, a friend of mine from high school who was a baseball player. He became a baseball player, did a lot of uh, coaching after that. And he wrote this Facebook post about elbow surgery that a lot of high school baseball players end up having. How all these young kids end up having elbow surgery at the age of 14 and 15 because they're throwing fastballs. Now, the fastball, let me try to get this out here, and uh, all of you baseball buffs out there can correct all the details in the comments if you want. The fastball, you're essentially holding your arm like this, and it's pitched forward in this fashion, right? So the finger's down, and you can put a lot of power into that. But as a result, from being thrown in this position, there is a lot of pressure on the elbow joint. And so throwing a bunch of fastballs every day, over and over again, stresses this out. And so a lot of these young guys, after a relatively short career, end up ruining their elbows. And it's the same kind of deal with, with tennis players and, and certain uh, serves and swings that they use with, uh, with that. So my friend, uh, Derek, he says um, what they should be doing is throwing curveballs. And the difference between throwing a fastball like this and a curveball like that. And then you're going to Notice my arm is straight, elbows in here, and then I turn at the last second. And I realized, wait a minute, that is exactly like Jack Dempsey's description of an impure punch coming in at this angle, and a pure punch coming in like this, exactly like a curveball. So straight, thumb up, elbow close to the body, elbow down, and then when we extend it, then we turn, right? So notice there's no flaring out of the elbow. There's none of this that happens on the impure punch. So if essentially we're punching like this, we're going to give ourselves tendonitis and tennis elbows. Okay? And I realized, whoa, that's what's happening to me. So I changed my punching form. So anytime I, I filmed myself, I filmed a lot of my bag sessions and I watched for every time it would come up. And I remember years ago, one of my old coaches, Shane Brenner, he would have me do this drill called wall jabs and wall crosses. He'd have me stand right up next to a wall and throw my jabs and throw my punches. And if my elbows knocked against the wall, wasn't doing it right. And I didn't know anything about Jack Dempsey's pure punching, impure punching ideology. But he was teaching me exactly that, to throw them straight as opposed to impure like this. I mean, both punches go out straight, but it's the position of the elbow. So we want our elbow pointing down and the thumb pointing up until we connect and then whoom, we'll flip it at the last second. So it comes out like a vertical punch, like a Wing Chun style punch at first, but then twist. And now it's upside down. Start out giving them the, thumb, the thumbs up. Good job. Not so much. Now you must pay. Die. Anyway, going over the top here. So that, after several months of changing my bag work from the impure punch even a little bit, even sometimes when you get tired, sometimes we get lazy and this starts coming out, right? I made a very concerted effort to keep throwing those pure punches. The second thing I did was change my diet a little bit. And all I did was add more saturated fat to my diet. And that might sound kind of weird and counterintuitive because it's the opposite of what the health industry was telling us for many years way back in the day. 
but there are a lot of saturated fats which can actually reduce inflammation. Things such as butter, like real butter from grass-fed cows, uh, coconut oil, fish oils, a lot of different types of saturated fat that comes in the form of oil can actually help to decrease inflammation. Um, certain foods like, um, man, just off the top of my head, I can't think of a, a lot of them, but do a Google search for foods that decrease inflammation and start adding those to your diet. Garlic, I think that's one of those. Uh, turmeric and certain spices like that can decrease inflammation. And there are certain foods that can increase inflammation. For example, unsaturated fats, any type of oil that's been, you know, uh, hydro, how do you say that word, hydrogenalized, when they run hydrogen through it to make it all into margarine and all this fake garbage you don't want to, you don't want to ingest. Avoid that stuff because it will increase inflammation. So pay attention to your punching form, pay attention to your diet. And for me, that made the biggest difference in the world. I went from feeling like a cripple, like I needed to quit altogether, to feeling awesome. And it happened a whole lot quicker than I thought it would, in a matter of months, as opposed to years and years. So, great question. Good luck to you. Speedy recovery, my friend. And it never hurts to put some ice on it. Q&A with the calls. Thanks for watching. Now get out there and train.